Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasure of blessings, a giver of life, come and abide in us, and us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Today, uh, as I mentioned to you, as I promised to you the last time, after we finished those five Bible studies that we had on the heresy of the apocatastasis or the restoration, I wanted to touch something uh, uh, which is a very important subject about the evolutionism and the Darwin's theory and what is the position of the modern saints and elders regarding this. So hopefully, if not, if we don't finish everything today, we'll finish the next time and we'll have uh, Father Matthew as well trying to give an input and help us uh, you know, expand on this subject. But my deep, deep uh, wish is for all of us to start, uh, God willing, in the near future when the time is right, to start some Bible studies on the book of Revelation. Uh, and uh, I think that will be a very interesting topic because today, when you open the, 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 the mainstream YouTube uh, content creators or people who are talking about the church, they are focusing on a, a very false narrative that I think it lacks a, a proper uh, patristic uh, interpretation uh, of, the, of the book of Revelation, which is also the book of, uh, that, that seals the, the Old and the New Testament, all of the Holy Scriptures. That's why it's the last book, but it's the book of the past, of the present, and above all, the book of the future. And the future events. So it will be a very interesting topic to cover. Uh, it's going to be probably a longer series of, of uh, Bible studies, but it's worth it. We'll have in between, of course, Q and A, so we can, of course, of course discuss certain topics uh, when it comes to that and try to answer as much as we can questions and uh, uh, let no stone unturned when it comes to uh, to interpreting the scriptures. Uh, but today, I'll share with you my screen. Let me just uh, open it here. Uh, we'll start with this topic, which is the modern saints and elders on evolutionism, but also what is the Orthodox Christian perspective? What is the opinion of the modern fathers? And when I say modern, bear in mind, this is more of a, a way of trying to understand that uh, the, the saints are the same. As Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And as we don't have difference between the Old and the New Testament, uh, because it's all one Holy Scripture. So as the saints who are basically the vivid or the practical manifestation of the presence of the Lord, they witness the truth in the same way as the saints in the past. So for example, there is no difference between St. John the theologian and John the Baptist or Holy Prophet Moses, or the Patriarch Abraham, or the saints, or the prophets of the of the Old Testament that we have, King David, Isaiah, uh, Avakum, and, and many others, they all are inspired by the same spirit, by the same Lord who governs everything. And in this spirit, we need to understand that uh, when we listen to the fathers of the church, when I say the fathers, I mean the mothers, the children, all of those people who dwell into the holiness of the Lord, they're the people who speak inspired by the Holy Spirit. So even though they can have personal opinions, sometimes they don't always have to be right about everything because they're humans above all. However, when it comes to interpreting the reality around us through the prism of the, of the teachings of the church, they all share the same spirit. They all share the same teaching. That's what's very exceptional about the fathers. Uh, when, for example, in the book of Revelation, in many parts, we see that God dwells among his saints. God walks among the saints. In the book of Revelation, it is described by seven churches in Asia Minor. When Christ reveals to St. John that he's walking uh, among the, those seven churches, uh, being constantly in dynamic presence uh, in the church. And the way how God walks among, among us is through the holiness of his people. Uh, we are created to become the image and the likeness of God. And if we acquire this holiness, we become the vessels, if you will, of God's presence on earth and among the people. 
Christ says, if you have done this to any of those little ones, you have done it to me. And be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So that's this uh, call for holiness, longing for the, for the upper Jerusalem and become the citizens of the kingdom of heaven is something that is happening right now to all of us while we are living our lives. Sometimes we struggle with certain things. For example, people can say, well, it's hard for me to focus on prayer. My mind is blurred or I, I'm not focused or I, I cannot think about the Lord. But the fathers are teaching us that it is possible to fulfill one or maybe one of the most mystical commandments that Christ is giving us to us when he says, pray ceaselessly, pray without ceasing. By prayer, not referring to uh, just, uh, let's say, only say our Father or just the Jesus prayer, but to be able to have a constant memory, constant remembrance of the, that we are in the presence of the Lord, who is the same God before today and yesterday and tomorrow, who is the same God in everything that we do. And if we try to grasp or to uh, dive into this mystery. We, even when we eat our lunch, we can say it with prayer. Even when we take a shower, we can still take a prayer. Whatever we do, we can become a prayer, can become a prolonged liturgy. That spirit, the fathers of the church, when uh, we live in this time where uh, we are faced with a lot of challenges, especially from the scientific community, who is trying, uh, that is trying to impose on us certain uh, theories and intellectual speculations as dogmas, as truth, it's very important to listen to what the fathers have to say about this and then move on. So I chose this topic because uh, I think probably a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, we had one Bible study in which we talked about what the science tells about science or the theory of evolution or Darwin, Darwinianism or Darwinism. And in that uh, lecture, we uh, said a lot of things that many, many so-called uh, Darwinians disagree with Darwin's theory because uh, it has ceased to exist. They cannot find a tangible proof to kind of validate his theory. So that's why it's called the theory. However, we live in a world today that since we grow up in, in elementary school, even in kindergartens, we are taught that we come from the apes, that we were animals, that the world existed for billions, gajillions years. Sometimes they don't even cannot agree how many millions year, years before. But anyway, uh, we would like to uh, do this. I'm using this, uh, um, I'm using the Orthodox word again, which is a publication by the Platinum uh, in, in California, Platinum, the monastery, the Brotherhood of St. Herman of Alaska in California. And Father Damaskin has a little uh, introduction to today's topic that we would like to uh, cover. And uh, he says that in 2000, um, the St. Herman Brotherhood published the Genesis, Creation, and Early Man by Father Seraphim Rose. That's the book that, let me see if I have here the, yes, this is the book that you can see uh, in, in front of your screens. Uh, I strongly recommend for you to read this book because uh, it's compiled posthumously from a rich array of materials left behind by Father Seraphim Rose. Uh, we call him Father Seraphim Rose, but uh, trust me, a lot of Orthodox Christians today, they recognize him as a saint. On the right side of the picture, you have Abbot Damaskin in the center uh, with the cross uh, with his brotherhood of St. Herman of Alaska. And that's the, the monks. Those are the monks who lived there. Um, hi, Nicholas. Uh, uh, I'm glad you joined us. And... Um, uh, the book presents, this book of Father Seraphim Rose, the timeless teaching of the Orthodox Church is found in her holy scriptures and the writings of the Holy Fathers on the events of creation, um, uh, the first created world, the natures of created things, the original nature of man, the cosmic consequences of man's fall, and the early history of mankind. For all of those who have, you who have read uh, Father Seraphim Rose, uh, you know how rich, how deep this person is. He himself was a person of um, spiritual struggle. He was looking for God. He ended up even from being uh, some form of a Protestant, then ending up in Buddhism. He went through a lot of to the cultural revolution that happened in the 60s here. Father Seraphim Rose ended up becoming an Orthodox Christian, of course, through the spiritual guidance of St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, who, by the way, uh, was found incorruptible and his body is laid in, in San Francisco. So, uh, this book is very important for you to read. I think you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on a lot of Orthodox Christian websites that they, 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 they uh, sell spiritual literature. So 
we're going to take something of his teachings, but we're going to focus mainly on the, what the modern fathers are saying about this. That includes St. Nikolai Vzitra and Okrit, St. Justin the philosopher, St. Justin Popovich of Chile of Serbia, what uh, St. Paisios, Porfirios, uh, Father St. Uh, Sofroni Saharov, many saints are saying about the theory of uh, uh, evolution or the Darwin's theory. So in the second edition of the Genesis uh, Creation and Early Man, Father Damaskin is telling us, which was published in 2011, 10 years later, 11 years since 2000, and the first publication, we subsequently, they added the theological and scientific material in the footnotes and appendices, as well as in the preface. One of our aims is to us to provide a more representative treatment of the patristic interpretation of the book of Genesis, quoting or at least listing the patristic sources that touch upon each um, salient point of exegesis. Another was to address theological and scientific issues that came to attend our attention since the first edition was published. Uh, a number of these issues were brought up to, by, brought up by our readers and by those whom we met at conferences. Others were found in various books and articles, including two length reviews of the present book, which is the, gen, the, the, the recent publication of this book, The Genesis, Creation, and the Early Man of the Orthodox Christian Vision. Um, by uh, George uh, Theokritov uh, and St. Vladimir Theological Quarterly. And there are others, so he's referring here to certain sources. We're not going to read them all. But so uh, with the help from Orthodox patristic scholars and scientists active in the respective, respective fields, we have attempted to respond to the most pertinent questions and challenges that have been re raised in recent times concerning the Orthodox doctrine of creation. That's why today we're going to, uh, go a little bit deeper into this um, uh, topic. So, uh, because Father Seraphim's primary aim, who actually maybe was one of the first who kind of shine of light from a modern perspective uh, to explain the Orthodox position, and by that explaining the position of the fathers of the church when it comes to this, uh, the topic of uh, Darwinian theory or the evolutionism. So Father Seraphim's primary aim was to present the Orthodox scriptural patristic teaching of creation undiluted, unabbreviated, uncompromised in all its divine grandeur. The second aim was, which he found less inspiring but no less urgent, was the, to counter the false origin story that had been embraced by the secular world and that sadly had influenced the thinking of many Orthodox Christians, namely the Darwinian fantasy of the origin of all life forms from a hypothetical common ancestor via undirected natural processes. Today, you will find a lot of, unfortunately, even Orthodox academics who uh, love to intellectualize. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find my guess. Yes, yes, thank you, Nicholas. We're trying to intellectualize the scripture, intellectualize the faith, and then easily fall into their own trap of trying to discern the scriptures with their own intellect and end up actually uh, agreeing with the world. That's, that's the danger that all of the fathers are teaching us of how to uh, approach the, the teachings of the, of, the, of the fathers or how to read uh, the scripture. So comparing the patristic teaching on the creation of all things by God with the Darwinian theory of the evolution of all living things without any divine agency, Father Seraphim found that the ancient fathers, although they of course did not refute evolutionism per se, since it had not been invented until the recent times, provided a definite refutation of its main tenets, of its main tenets. In the first place, they explicitly rejected the scientific philosophical speculation of their own days, which, was, uh, 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 which gave a naturalistic origin of the cosmos. That's also the heresy of deism. Uh, deism is, the, is an ancient uh, philosophy or ideology that teaches that the world, the cosmos, is the oldest, is God, basically. And they give, uh, they deify, or they, there is a deification of the natural uh, order of the world, the cosmos, the universe. For example, the chance of self-organization of matter without any divine intervention, in which thereby anticipated the modern theory of evolution. As against such the, uh, uh, theories, the fathers affirmed that God's supernatural acts of creation would direct instantaneous and effortless, showing forth his omnipotence. Secondly, they spoke at length on the distinction between the kinds of organisms uh, that we see in Genesis verse 1, uh, 11 to 12, verse 20 to 26. And of course, strongly I would recommend to read uh, the, the I, I know it as the, 
Shestodnev, The Six Days of uh, St. Basil the Great, a beautiful book in which you will see how St. Basil the Great very diligently talks about the creation of the Lord and he interprets the book of Genesis, especially about the creation of the world and creation of man. Uh, so uh, the kinds of organisms that are being described both at the time of their creation and afterwards and were clearly against any philosophy that would confuse that distinction. Their teaching, because it was normal in the pagan world people to give um, deified attributes to the nature. Uh, people, uh, I know from the Slavic culture, before the Slavs converted to Christianity, they were one of the most horrible pagans. They would give, uh, they would have gods of the thunder, just like the Greeks would have the gods of the sea, the gods of the wind, and, and so on and so forth. They would attribute all these things to the gods of the forest, the, all, all this mythology that now we are finding kind of interesting watching in Disney movies or else. They're teaching a lot for variation within each kind, which is uh, observable and scientifically demonstrable, but was adamantly opposed to the idea that one kind could be transformed into another, an idea intrinsic to modern evolutionary theory, but scientifically unprovable. And this is something that we'll talk about today. This is the book, uh, sorry for, it's been a little cut on the side, that's how it got on the, the PowerPoint. Um, so uh, this is Father Seraphimus. I found this beautiful picture of him. Uh, this is on his, uh, when he died, on his reposal. You can see almost, uh, he has a blessed uh, expression of his face. Uh, he was struggling. He died pretty much young, very young, and considered by many people today as a saint uh, of the church. So the Orthodox saints and elders after Darwin, we're talking now about the fathers that we're going to talk about them today, whom one might call modern day holy fathers, uh, had the same mind as the earlier saints for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as we said in Hebrew, uh, chapter 13, verse 8. So if you remember, when we talk about the saints, probably you have heard that sometimes maybe confusing to some of you. For example, St. Justin Popovich that we're going to, if not today, tomorrow, discussing on this subject, you'll see that we call him Justin the New, or Justin of Chelia. Because there's another Justin, uh, the philosopher and the martyr from the first century, who was the, uh, or the second century, who was the successor of the apostolic uh, fathers, who uh, is also... A very important saint. Many times we hear about saints in the recent ages of the past, let's say since after the 16th century, after the fall of Constantinople, many saints who have the same name, who share the same name with older saints, they live before that, before them, they, we give the attribute the new. So we have the martyr this, but new, Justin the new, or Peter the new, and so forth. That is because somehow, according to the words of Father Athanasius uh, Metilenos, when he describes about the revolution, the church has this intuitive knowledge that we're approaching the end of time. We are approaching uh, the, uh, towards the end into our movement towards the eschaton. And the church gives these attributes new to the saints because uh, there will be no new new saints into the, into the near future or distant future, but rather we're going towards Christ. So kind of the circle is closing itself. And we're approaching. That's why so many heresies are approaching, so many false prophets, so many false teachers who are very convincible, very eloquent. And if we're not careful, they can easily be very damaging to, uh, to, the, to the Christian flock, to the church. So Christ is the head of his church. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his mind is the mind of his church, and the church's mind does not change. As the ancient saints refuted the naturalistic origin theories of their times, so the by the way, this is a pagan way of thinking to, to give, uh, uh, to deify the, the nature or the, the give uh, de, uh, deified attributes to the nature. So as the ancient saints refused the, uh, refuted the naturalistic origin theories of their times, so the holy ones of more recent times have rejected evolutionary theory as yet another attempt of rebellious humanity to dethrone God. In their public statements and writings, many of them equated Darwin's theory with unbelief, recognizing that it is not a scientific discovery based on evidence, but rather a materialistic philosophy imposed on the evidence. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll explain about this, uh, guys, uh, Darwin, of course, on the left, uh, Stephen J. Gold and Ernst May. 
Uh, but I would just add before uh, here that in that lecture that we had on, on Darwinian theory and the theory of evolution, we said that Darwin predicted that after his death in for the next hundred years, there will be multiple sources of DNA and fossils and whatnot. The sciences will discover and will find a missing link that uh, everything was uh, created through the process of evolution, not just 100 years later, many years later afterwards, none of such. As a matter of fact, we have less and less proofs, scientific proofs, I mean, that uh, uh, Darwin was right. And that's why this is uh, the post-Darwinian scientists, even though they hold his theory because they think it's a brilliant theory, even though he is wrong. However, they insist on, on, on uh, preaching the same thing without uh, scientific proof about it. But that's something that we talked about back uh, three years ago. We'll come back to that when it's needed. For now, we just want to focus on the modern fathers. So is atheist evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould and Ernst May, that you have them here in the picture, have shown, um, have shown through researching Charles Darwin's notebooks, Darwin intensified himself as a philosophical materialist, hence, in essence, an atheist. As early as May 1838, several months before he developed the idea of natural selection as the driving force behind evolution. Gold, ever since Darwin, that's published in New York uh, in 1979. That's his, those are his words um, on, on one long argument. Moreover, uh, his early notebooks show that he entertained two other mutually exclusive materialistic theories of evolution before finally arriving at his final theory, which indicates that he was attempting to make empirical data conform to his prior philosophical outlook by means of various hypothetical models and mechanisms. Having settled on natural selection as the mechanism, he was well aware that the through outgoing materialism of his theory rendered a supernatural creator superfluous. He wrote, the old argument of, quote, the old argument of design in nature as given by William Paley fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. discovered. This is on autobiography of Charles Darwin in uh, 1958, published in 1958. So according to, he referred to natural selection as my deity, of course, in, um, uh, in quotes, <clears throat> and to his theory as the devil's gospel. As historian of science, George James Grinnell uh, from Hamilton, Ontario, McMaster University, um, has concluded after years of research into Darwin's public and private writings, quote, I have done a great deal of work on Darwin and can say with some assurance that Darwin also did not derive his theory from nature, but rather superimposed a certain philosophical worldview on nature and then spent 20 years trying to gather the facts to make it stick. You see, this is um, basically atheists or, or evolutionists criticizing Marx, admitting that, uh, not Marx, I'm sorry, Darwin, criticizing him for uh, him being uh, speculative in, in, in his scientific approach. Of course, uh, often Darwin's not the many scientists will, will of course, uh, confirm uh, this fact. So, since the theory arose in Western Europe, let me just move the slide. Um, after many centuries of apostasy from the Orthodox faith, the Orthodox saints saw it as a sign of the West's loss of faith in the Christian God. That also happened in the East with the communism. I remember when I was a student uh, to believe in. Um, uh, to believe in uh, God was nonsense, was a joke, while Darwin and, and the theory of evolution was, uh, was something that uh, was in, something that was important to explore and was part of the regular curriculum and no questions asked, no, no even uh, a slightest uh, attempt to challenge that idea. As we know, science is all about challenging uh, and retesting the proposed theories uh, by the science in general. Since they understood that the initial aim of Darwin's theory was to find an explanation for the origin of living things without the need for a divine creator. You see, this is very important. The idea is not to prove whether this is the truth or not, but to find a way that the origin of living things are, don't need a need for uh, the divine creator. It never occurred to them as it has to theistic evolutionaries past and present to try to insert God into 
a philosophy that had been devised in order to keep him out. Participating in, in the divine human life of the Orthodox Church in full measure, they affirmed that evolutionism is foreign to the church. Their common witness shows for the fact that evolutionism is in conflict with a basic spiritual awareness about God. Man and the cosmos is imparted to Christians, especially those closest, uh, closest to God. So in addition to understanding uh, the Orthodox doctrine of creation, Darwinian evolution subverts the church's doctrine of redemption. That's why we're going to try to uh, answer this. So what is the, this says the Holy Father, the Holy Fathers, this is my mistake on the, on the slide, and the idea of evolution. Briefly, the scriptural patristic teaching of the church is that the world was originally created incorrupt and the death and that death came into the world through Adam and Eve's sin. So this is the, the idea of, uh, of the uh, patristic teaching of the fathers, of all of the fathers. Christ took upon himself the ultimate physical consequence of sin, death, and in dying and rising from the grave. He abolished all the consequences of sin, spiritual and physical, for all who would believe in him. Evolutionism which teaches that corruption and death were present in the world from the beginning and that the death is in fact responsible for the origin of living things, including man, cannot allow for the Christian teaching on the original incorruption or on death entering the world through man's fall. They're two, completely two opposite ideas. It's like uh, dark and light, darkness and light. Since the two teachings are incompatible, any attempt to conform Christianity to evolutionism must result in a diminution of the former. Thus, for the Christian evolutionists, of course, those are those so-called uh, uh, Orthodox Christians who hold this idea that there is Christian evolutionism and so forth. It's put in, in um, Christian evolutionism, uh, which evolutionists should be taken in uh, with a lot of grain of salt. When it becomes of the doctrine of Christ taking upon himself the final consequence of sin, death to overcome all the consequences of sin, such a person cannot believe in this doctrine simply as did Christians of earlier times prior to Darwin. If he believes it at all, it can only be in an attenuated way as one appreciates poetry or mythology. We can use it as an allegory, but not as a truth. Needless to say, such a cavalier approach to faith cannot be acceptable to the conscious Orthodox Christians. And this is the topic we're discussing, because we will see what is the language of the fathers. We will see what the fathers taught about this. Because if we can accept evolutionism or the theory of evolution or Darwinian theory as possible Orthodox, because the basic argument is, well, uh, when God talks about the creation of the world in six days, he doesn't use the word days. That's the common, uh, very regular sentence you will hear, or wisdom, of course, in, um, uh, by, by those, those people, uh, trying to say, well, he was talking about the eons, that uh, it's a period of time. And an eon can be, which one day can be either 24 hours, or it can be 24 million years. It doesn't make any difference. So from that perspective, we should... Uh, accept because of that um, the, the, the evolutionism. Of course, this is false, and we'll, we'll explain why. So in appendix to the second edition of Genesis, Creation, and Early Man, the, the book of Father Seraphim Rose, we included, but the Damascus continues, the testimony of some of those saints and righteous ones of recent centuries who spoke and wrote about their Venian evolution. But those who have not yet read the book, uh, that's something that uh, it's uh, very, very important to do. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more. But the Seraphimos talks about all sorts of things. We'll hopefully we'll touch upon one section just on his approach on nihilism. And you will see how uh, in his days, in the 80s, when he was writing those things, uh, they correspond and, and relate to the days that we live in today in the postmodernism and so forth. So not only uh, the, Holy Scripture, the Holy Scriptures, but also uh, from spiritual experience, these saints and elders of recent centuries have known a creator who can and did make all things in instantaneous, effortless, creative acts. Such a creator, they have testified, could not be associated with blind, fumbling, laborious process, which, according to evolutionism, brought living things into being. The spiritual awareness of uh, modern-day saints um, and elders was expressed by 
uh, saints of earlier ages in response to other form of error. Thus, for example, in the second century, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, you will see he's quoted a lot uh, by a lot of fathers, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, who a saint from the second and the third century, took pains, uh, to, pains to refute the Valentinian Gnostic doctrine of the creation of the world by an ignorant fumbling demir demiurg. Demiurgos in, in Greek means uh, the creator, but not a creator as, as we have creator who also holds everything as Pantocrator, but Dimurgos or Dimir is the one who from already something that is existence in existence, like maybe um, a chaos, he organizes and that's why he's called uh, Dimur, Dimurgos. Uh, and Saint Irene of Lyon was fighting uh, against this uh, uh, heresy. So as Bishop uh, 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 a bishop in A. Steinberg of London and Western Europe has pointed out this Valentinian concept of origins bears a certain resemblance to today's concept of the blind fumbling process of evolution. And any deity that a theistic evolutionist might associate with such a process must inevitably bear some unwelcome res um, resemblance to the Valentinian demiurge itself. It's repetition of the ancient heresies uh, that existed even in the time of Saint Irene of Lyon, either through the Gnostics or through the Manichaeism or some other heresies that existed, the church always thought. So this is nothing new, even might, might sound strange to you, but the Darwinian theory, it's not a kind of a new challenge, let's say, for the church, or that he came to something, something that is just um, expressed in a, in a modern language and it makes a different uh, approach. But uh, it's basically uh, the same uh, heresy from, from the time when St. Irineofion was fighting um, the, the Demiurgists or the Valentinian Gnostic doctrine. So moreover, these saints and elders uh, have known again, not just form, uh, from sacred writings, but from living experience, a creator who made the world very good in the beginning without death, suffering, disease, and all the other negative elements that entered the world through human sin. You see, when I, when I mentioned the Valentinian Gnosticism, uh, even today, scientists, when they talk about the Big Bang, they say there was a, uh, everything that exists was basically billions of years ago. It was in a nucleus of, of existence, or like a small dot that exploded. And over time, it created everything that we can see now. And always when he asked the question, what was behind that? What made that nucleus exist in the first place? Or someone has created, or if not, what created it? We don't have the answer. That is the mystery of creation. So. Basically, it's just a repetition that the Demiurg, the, the, the god of chaos, brings to order the chaos into certain order, and he becomes the Demiurg. But that means that even the nature, which is, again, uh, another natural heresy, the, the heresy of the, uh, of, of the nature, that the, the nature exists, the cosmos existed from everlasting, there is no beginning, gives uh, a deification to the, to the nature. Nature is God, is the mother goddess, if you will. And that the Demir creates out of nature what we now call the world, the planets, and, and so forth, everything that is in existence, including the animals and everything biological and non-biological that is put in existence. For that reason, we need to explain and detect the, 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 the ancient heresies as well into this. Thus, they have rejected the evolutionary doctrine that regards all these aspects of corruption as having always existed in the world. They have made it clear that if one accepts the evolutionary view that death it's not the consequence of sin, then one has undercut the foundation of one's belief in Christ's redemption of mankind from the consequences of sin. Um, we'll talk about this specifically when we're going to talk about St. Nikolai of Zitra and Ohrid and St. Justin of Celia from Serbia. They talk about this and very explicitly explain the, the dangers of accepting such a, I would say not even a theology, but ideology. If the Orthodox Christian of today turn not to the saints, but to the secular wise man, of course, this wise man is um, um, in quotes, for answers to the ultimate questions of our existence, their deception is certain. Let us then turn to the saints, says Father Damaskin, and righteous and both of recent and past times for answers to these questions, beginning with the first, where did we come from? For when we know where we came from, according to the fullness of the revelation of the Orthodox Church, we will also know why we are here and what God in his infinite mercy intends for our final 
designation. This is uh, uh, something that uh, we all need to understand that if we want to talk about almost any topic that is happening around us, that includes of every aspect of it, whether it's education, culture, the way of life, philosophy, politics, social life, we cannot discern rightfully so if we don't listen to what we call the conscious of the world, and that is the church. The church is, as uh, what, Sen, what Father um, Metropolitan um, Yerotei Vlach, Yerote Vlachos of Nepaktius talks about, the church is always the conscious uh, of the society. And without the voice of the fathers, which are the whisper of that conscious, how can we know and discern and between the good and the evil spirit? St. Paul is calling it to be vigilant and to be able to discern the evil from the good. So in that spirit, we, uh, let's see what the saints and the elders, the holy elders and the saints have to say. So we'll start first, with, let's say with St. Ambrose, who is an elder of Optina. He lived from 1812. 1891 is considered the pinnacle of a century-long succession of holy heroes of Optina Monastery, whose God-given clairvoyance and God-revealed counsels attracted spiritual seekers from throughout Russia. Elder Ambrose lived during the time when Darwinian ideas were first making themselves known in Russia. This is the time right before the revolution in Russia. And an aphorism that has come down to us, he identifies as nonsense the evolutionary notion of the origin of living things and the descent of men. Quote, don't believe at face value all kinds of nonsense without investigation that something can come into being of itself from dust and that people used to be apes. This is his uh, opinion about this. Then we have St. Theophon the Rectus, Bishop of Tambov. Probably you have heard of him, a great saint and asket of the church. He lived in 1815, from, born in 1815, he died in 1894, was together with St. Filaret Druzhdov of Moscow and St. Ignatius Briancianinov of the Caucasus, one of the great and holy transmitters of patristic theology in 19th century Russia. Steeped in the wisdom of the fathers, not only in an, as, uh, on an intellectual, but also on a profound experiential level, he wrote classic works on the spiritual life and commentaries on holy scripture and translated many patristic works into Russian, including the complete Philokalia, a very important saying that probably when you read, uh, when, when someone is suggesting you some of the, uh, the church fathers, you will um, find his name among them uh, or the things that he wrote or translated. In order to help his fellow believers remain firm in the Orthodox faith within the context of modernity, he read widely in the fields of philosophy and science and stayed abreast of the latest uh, intellectual currents. So, just to explain, both of them, they lived in the, uh, uh, they died towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. You see that they uh, are addressing this issue at the, at the very time when, um, before the revolution, but all it started with the French Revolution. So this ideology of, of the Renaissance is something that we, we used to have Bible studies talking about, the, the, the fall of the Christianity uh, in the Western world, but also in the East with the coming of the communism and atheism uh, is a product of intellectual uh, man fallen thinking of, of the mankind. And it will cause so many disturbance, but it will create also, will become uh, the, the spring of a lot of heresies that will uh, overburden the, uh, the humanity. And they're still very vivid and very present in life, but they're nothing more than just the re-resurrection of the ancient heresy that existed in the church long before uh, the French Revolution, for example. Like, in we will one day, God willing, we can talk about just about the French Revolution and all the novelties that it brought and all the changes that will be very easily recognized, like the secularization that we see and we take today for granted. Many things that we don't even pay attention to them, they were already ideas and rooted into that rebellious spirit of the humankind, but which is basically the ultimate goal is to build the the Babylon Tower, and to dethrone God. When you see it in a more symbolic way, but now we see it in a practical way. So like his earlier contemporaries, St. Philaret and Ignatius, St. Theophon transmitted the authentic patristic teachings on the creation and original state of man and the universe. Unlike them, he lived to see the growing acceptance of the opposing worldview of Darwinism in the modern West. It is likely that St. Ignatius um, did encounter the newly promulgated Darwinian theory four or five years before his repose in 18. Uh, 67. 
At that time, speaking of the uh, uh, natural sciences, Ignatius commented on the, quote, arbitrary fantasies and hypotheses in the works of materialists and warned of the need to differ differentiate, uh, differentiate between these absurd ravings, in quotes, and the genuine findings of science. Even then, says that even when we read about so-called science, we need to always question the science and with science, with scientific approach, because science is not a God. Science is not a dogma. Science is an intellectual speculation of mankind. And it's good when it uh, helps mankind. But the problem is when it becomes uh, God to rule everything, it can become a totalitarian ruler, which can actually be very demonic and very dangerous. So realizing that this worldview was encroaching uh, into Russia, he warned his contemporaries of it in, uh, uh, in no uncertain terms. Uh, in the following passages, and, passages and Theophan compares uh, the unbelief of the Sadducees in Christ's time what with uh, that of the evolutionists of his own. The Sadducees in the time of Christ, remember the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sadducees uh, and the Pharisees were two religious parties, if you will, in, in the uh, Jewish society. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. And they were always fighting with each other. They were always um, intellectualizing the faith, trying to oversmart each other and so forth so people can uh, join their side and so forth. But um, he, uh, St. Theophan, compares them. So here's the, the, the quote that... Um, we have from, um, from him. The Sadducees had a seemingly insoluble objection to the resurrection, but the Lord resolved it with a few words to them. And so that's, remember when, when Christ was being asked by the Sadducees, uh, referring to, to him a woman that was five times married and now she is living with her sixth husband or sixth man. And they asked him, when she dies, uh, whose wife shall she be? And Christ says, don't you know, it is written already that there will be no marriage in the kingdom of heaven. That there will be no male or female, but everyone like angels in front of God. Just to remind you of what he's referring to. But the Lord resolved it with a few words to them. And so clearly that everyone understood and acknowledged the Sadducees to have been beaten by the truth of his word. What the Sadducees were then unbelievers of all sorts are now. They have heaped up a multitude of fanciful, fanciful suppositions for themselves, elevated them to the status of irrefutable truths, and plummeted themselves on them, assuming that nothing can be said against them. In fact, they are so ungrounded that it is not even worthwhile speaking against them. All of their sophistry, being sophisticated, is a house of cards blown on it, blow on it, and flies, and flies apart. There is no need to refute it in its parts. It is enough to regard it as one regards dreams. When speaking against dreams, people do not prove the absurdity in their composition or in their individual parts, but only say it was a dream. And with that, they resolve everything. It is the same with the theory of the formation of the world from a nebula and its supporters. Of course, a reference, this is a reference to the nebular hypothesis, according to which a nebula left over from the sense formation contained dust particles that acted as a supporters for the gradual accumulation of matter, leading to the formation of the Earth and the other planets and the solar system that we have today. So formulated in the 18th century by Emmanuel Edinburgh, Emmanuel Kant, and Pierce Simon Laplace, Laplace, the nebular hypothesis is today the predominant natural, naturalistic explanation of the origin of the solar system. This was uh, what Saint, uh, uh, Theophan was, was talking about. So it is the same with the theory of the formation of the world from a nebula and its supports with the theory of um, abigo, abiogenesis. Abiogenesis, that's the a reference to the modern naturalistic theory of how life on Earth arose from um, inanimate matter. And Darwin's origins of uh, genera or species, and with his last dream about the descent of man. Of course, he's referring now here to uh, Charles Darwin, the book of the origin of species, published in 1859, and the descent of man, which is in 1871. And 
So continue, Saint uh, Theophan. It is all like delirium. When you read them, you are walking in the midst of shadows. And scientists, well, then you can, what you can do with them. They, their motto is, if you don't like it, don't listen, but don't prevent me from lying. That's the problem. When people are, when we are uh, fall into spiritual delusion, no matter how much, even if Christ himself descends from heaven and tries to uh, tell me that I'm wrong, I would reject uh, him because I will insist on my uh, arrogant Luciferian uh, right to, to, to be right, even though if I'm uh, in false. This is, of course, in the, in, the, in, the, in the language of the Father, it's called spiritual delusion, but the world has not even heard of what prelist is. In the same work, St. Theophan speaks again of naturalistic theories of origins that had made their appearance in his time. Quote, the truth of God is simple. Can a proud man study it? Such a mind would rather think up its own things, sensational things, although empty, as weak as a spider's web. To see that this is so, look at the current theories of the creation of the world. They're like a somnambulistic or drunken delirium. And yet, how good they seem to those who invented them. How much energy and time are wasted on this and all in vain. The deed was accomplished simply. He spoke. This is from Psalm uh, 148, verse 5. He spoke and they came to be. He commanded and they were created. No one can think of anything better than this solution. Uh, this is from his thoughts. St. Theophan, the reckless thoughts uh, for each day of the year. Uh, it's also uh, published in, in English and, and translated so we can find. And then uh, the evolutionary theory of the descent of man from animals, wrote St. Theophan in continuation, is the consequence of man's running from God's authority and towards the unrestrained satisfaction of the passions. What ought we to preach, the saint asked. What should cry to all sons of the kingdom of heaven? Don't run from the kingdom into bondage and slavery, for they are in fact ru running. Some are captivated by the freedom of mind. They say, we don't want the bonds of fate and the oppression of authority, even divine authority. We'll figure things out and make up our minds for ourselves. So they have made up their minds. They have built fables in which there is more childishness than in the mythology of the Greeks, and they magnify themselves. Others are enticed by the broad path of the passions. They say, we don't want to know positive commandments of the demands of conscience. This is all abstract. We need tangible naturalness. And they have gone after it. What has come of it? They have bowed down before dumb beasts. Has not the theory that man originated from animals arisen from this moral fall? This is where they have gone. And everyone runs from the Lord. Everyone runs. This is from uh, the same uh, book that I just uh, mentioned a uh, short, short while ago. Elsewhere, St. Theophan wrote that Darwinianism, or Darwinism, together with other godless philosophers, philosophies from the West, is deserving of formal condemnation by the Orthodox Church. Quote, these days, many nihilists of both sexes, naturalists, Darwinists, spiritists, and westernizers in general have multiplied among us. Let me remind you, this is the time also when the, the theosophic society is being created with Blavatska and uh, exists to this day and uh, to, to this day. Just to, We'll have a special Bible study just to explain the theosophism. Basically, they're looking of the unification of all the religions into one religion. They even have their own representations in the United Nations, according to Lucid, Lucid Trust. It was a magazine that was started by the, the successor of Mar Mar Mary Blavatska, which is a Lucifer Trust, the original name was, in the 1930s. But they changed it now to Lucid Trust because it's controversial. And it still exists. Just go type on Google Lucid Trust and you will find it. And you will see even the, the demonic uh, symbolism and insignia that they have. And they're legitimate. Uh, all right. You're thinking, would the church have been silent? Would it not have preferred its voice? Would it not have condemned or anathemized them if there had been something new in their teaching? To be sure, a council would have done so without doubt. And all of them, with their teaching, would have been given over to anathema, to condemnation. To the current rite of orthodoxy, um, 
he refers to the, the right of Orthodoxy he served in churches on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, meaning, remember, the, the first Sunday of the Great Lent is called the, the Sunday of Orthodoxy of the Great Lent, usually with the higher uh, fishing or many priests we, here in our parish, in our uh, neighborhood here, we go to certain parish and all the priests of the area get together and we have the Synodicon uh, of Orthodoxy. But during the rite, anathemas are pronounced and heresies condemned at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Remember, we say the anathema against the the areas against the heretics, the Nestorius, and so forth. And we proclaim the faith. To be sure, council would have done so without doubt, and all of them with their teachings would have been given uh, over to anathema, to the current rite or the service of the orthodoxy of the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Only the following item would have to be added to Bachner, to Feuerbach, Darwin, Renan, Kardec, and all their followers anathema. Those are the Ludwig Bachner. An avid from he lived he died in 19, 1899. An avid proponent of Darwinism was one of the main exponents of scientific materialism in the 19th century. He is considered the father of atheistic evangelism in Germany, the counterpart of Thomas Henry Huxley in England. Ludwig Andreas von Feuerbach uh, from 1804 1872, a German philosopher and anthropologist, thought that God was but a projection of men's inner nature and needs. Very similar to what today Freud, Zygmunt Freud, and many of the so-called the fathers of psychotherapy are talking about the so-called archetypes. Uh, Carl Jung talks about this a lot as well. And well, that's another topic as well. We don't have time to talk about it. his materialism, atheism, though at times inconsistent, exerted a strong influence on the philosophy of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Those are the creators of communism, which Russia was and uh, majority of Eastern Europe was infected with. Ernest Renan from 1823-1892 was a French philosopher who sub submitted the Old Testament, the life of Christ and Christian history to throughout going rational analysis, which was removed from faith in the miraculous and the divine. Alan Kadak, 1804-1869 was the system systematizer of spiritism in France. So this, these are the people that um, Saint Theophan is uh, uh, emphasizing. And all of their uh, followers are nothing. But there is no need, continues St. Theophan, either for a special council or for any kind of addition. All of their false teachings were anathemized long ago. At the present time, not only in principal cities, but in all places and churches, the right of orthodoxy, the service of the Sunday of orthodoxy, ought to be brought in and celebrated so that all the teachings contrary to the word of God might be collected and that it might be proclaimed to everyone that uh, what they might must fear and from what teachings must they flee and all might know. Many are seduced intellectually only through ignorance and therefore a public condemnation of pernicious teachings would save them from destruction. If the action of an anathema is a terrible to someone, then let him avoid the teachings that lead to it. Let him who is afraid of it for the sake of others bring them back to a healthy teaching. If you who are not favorably disposed to this ancient, to this action are orthodox, then you are going against yourself. And if you have already lost sound teachings, teaching, then what business do you have concerning what is done in the church that supports it? After all, you've already separated yourself from the church and have your own convictions, your own way of looking at things. Well, live with them then. It's all the same whether or not your name and your teaching are uttered under the anathema. You're already under anathema. If you philosophize against the church and persist, persist in, the, in this philosophizing. This is from his Sozerzani, uh, Razmishlenia, which is Contemplations and Reflections, published in uh, 1998 in Pravilovedi in Moscow. St. Theophan predicted that if naturalistic, this is talking in the 19th century, uh, he predicted that if naturalistic evolutionary notions of the world's origin continue to be propagated, the resulting loss of faith among the Russian people would help pave the way for the overthrow of the Orthodox Christians government of Russia. Less than the, the three decades later, his prediction would be fulfilled. As he observed, and we'll finish with this, people have, quote, people have suddenly had a thought and have started to write about uh, preser preserving faith, but they don't want to block the source of unbelief. This source is the spread of the teaching that the world formed by itself, according to which there is no need for God and the soul does not exist. Let me pause just to explain something, what he's talking about. This is all for all of us lukewarm Christians. On one hand, want to be seen as academics and intellectuals, and we flirt with the world. And at the same time, we want to also be 
um, uh, part of the church. This is that spiritual schizophrenia that exists in all of us. And this is how St. Theophan is diagnosing it even in that time. It is all atoms and chemistry, nothing more. This is being preached at university, rostrums, and in literature. He who breathes these fumes is incapably stupefied and loses his sense and fate until these books are destroyed, until professors and literary men are forced not only not to hold to this years, but even to demolish it. Until then, faithlessness will grow and grow, and with it, self-will and the destruction of the present government. That's the way the French Revolution went. went. And this is exactly what happened to the, to the uh, Russian dynasty. Uh, as you know, in 1926, all the Romanovs were slaughtered by the communists and killed. And who came? The Bolsheviks, the, uh, the propagandists of these theories. Already in his time, St. Theophan saw the science was increasingly becoming a godless enterprise, which worked on the assumption that nature is all there is, and that therefore materialistic explanations can account for everything that exists. At the same time, he saw that the natural sciences were being falsely held up as the most reliable and authoritative source of all knowledge. In various places, he spoke of this increasingly pervasive problem. There is not a single science which could be established solely on its own principles. Something can be obtained from all the sciences. But this is not something that gives one the right to cite science as a decisive authority. It is not science itself that is the problem, but scientists, the people, the scientists, who twist science however they want. Consequently, they're only the conjectures and in inferences of scientists. Then he says, uh, he continues to talk. We'll, of course, uh, we'll, when we don't have time to, uh, to, to cover that. We'll, we'll continue the next time because it's already seven. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We'll pause here. But we'll cover basically what uh, St. John of Crosstown has to say, another great saint, uh, of course, we'll, we'll uh, take a look of uh, St. Vladimir, who was martyred uh, by the communists, uh, St. Nectarius of Fegina, uh, and St. Versinus of Optimus. You even have uh, how St. Vladimir, how Martyr Vladimir was uh, held by the guards. There's the icon of him, St. Nectarius of Fegina, St. Versinus of Optina. We will have, of course, um, Ilarion Troitsky, uh, we'll have uh, Haramarte Tadeus, Spensky, and many other fathers in Nikola Vzicha, and of course, some uh, Luke, Archbishop of Sinferiopol, and of course, uh, St. Justin, the new Pope of Celia, who is also uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, input into, into this subject. We'll Soproni of Essex, St. Paisios, of course, and Father George Calcio. So, uh, today, uh, we'll have to pa pause here because we're already uh, beyond our schedule. So, well, God willing, we'll continue uh, next Bible studies if we have time. We'll see how it will work with Father Matthew as well. But the whole idea is to start this topic, which I think is very important in order to understand what is the position of the fathers of the church when it comes to teaching of the, of the Darwinian theory, of the theory of evolution. Uh, <clears throat> so... With that being said, let's uh, finish with it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, we'll have to uh, uh, we'll have to uh, pause. We'll have to read the prayer so we can uh, finish for today. Let's see here. Okay. Um, God willing, uh, we'll have uh, paraclesis on Friday evening. Uh, we'll continue with our catechism next Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we'll continue with, it, with this topic. It's not a long topic. I think the next um, Bible studies will finish everything, but you will see very interesting things being said by the fathers. And <clears throat> then we can maybe uh, move on to some different topics that are even more, more engaging, more interesting to cover. So that's all for today. Uh, let's say the prayer and uh, we can all go. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us to save us. Amen.